My name is Sucharit Bhakti and I'm a physician, uh, a trained microbiologist and infectious disease man and uh, I've worked all my life in the field of infectious diseases and immunology. I chaired the Department of Medical Microbiology and Hygiene at the University of Mainz from 1990 to 2012, after which I am living in retirement. And uh, that's, I think, all I have to say. On February 28th, you and 11 other prominent scientists, including a former vice president of Pfizer, sent a letter to the European Medicines Agency highlighting seven chief concerns surrounding the agency's recent authorization of the experimental COVID-19 vaccines. Can you summarize your concerns, that the concerns that you raised in that letter? Well, um, the bottom line of this letter was that we were concerned that the dangers of uh, thrombosis, clot formation, intravasal clot formation had not been sufficiently addressed by the EMA and we asked them to supply evidence that these, this danger of clot formation uh, had been considered and that there was evidence to exclude that our fears were founded. That is the gist of the letter. Based on what is known in medicine, uh, one would have to fear that people, especially young people, by the way, uh, uh, who received these gene-based vaccines would develop uh, clotting uh, abnormalities. Did you receive a response to your letter? Well, we asked them to respond within one week. Uh, we did not receive a response in that one week from the 1st of March to the 8th of March. But in that one week, ironically enough, Reports came in uh, from all of Europe of young people who had coagulopathies, that means clotting abnormalities, uh, with a series of deaths. And this caused uh, 15 countries to suspend their um, vaccination program with AstraZeneca vaccine. So, uh, obviously, the EMA was forced to provide an explanation and that they, they didn't provide an explanation but they released news at a press conference on the 17th of March to reassure everyone in the world uh, that there was no certain uh, connection to the vaccination. Now, I want to go into this because this has become a very, very important issue. They said that these deaths had been due to one of two, one of two very rare clotting abnormalities. One was the so-called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. That is a condition that arises when you have so many clots forming in your body that your clotting, uh, your clotting system is exhausted and so you start to bleed. This is very paradoxical and it's extremely rare. Um, the second were, was the formation of blood clots in, your, in the veins of the brain. So to cut a long story short, what they said was we had five cases of DIC in individuals under 50 and 12, it's now become 13 by the way, uh, cases of intracranial, intracerebral uh, blood clot. And uh, this was very unfortunate, but considering the benefit that we're getting, uh, the risks are minuscule because the numbers are so small. So if you ask me what normal numbers they quoted, I will tell you, they said, but normally, one would have expected around 1.3 cases of cerebral venous thrombosis. It's, that's what it's called, CVT. All right. And every 
condition, every case, suspected case of CVT is an emergency. You've got to go to the emergency department, you've got to have your head scanned, and you've got to have your blood taken to see if there's a clot. And if there is, you've got to get your therapy immediately, okay? And they said, well, we had 12 cases. Uh, the expected number was 1.3, which means that we can't totally exclude it. But the numbers are so small on an absolute basis that they should be accepted because the benefit is so great. With regard to DIC, the number was five, five. The one number to be expected was below one, quote unquote, below one. And when I read this, I said, you guys have to be taken to court. How can you say this to people who are simply unknowing, said, okay, five cases is bad, but the benefit. So now let me tell you that nine to 10 people lost their lives under 60. They were under 55. Up till then, they're completely healthy. If upon vaccination of 10 million individuals under 60, because AstraZeneca said we've vaccinated 20 million and saved 20 million lives now, if 10 million were under 60 and you lost 10 lives, how many lives would you expect it to lose? alone because of these two extremely rare conditions if you had vaccinated the 60 million Germans under 60 to save their lives. 60 would die because of the vaccine, okay? Now, in the first six months of 2020, during the first wave of this so-called pandemic, how many Germans under 60 lost their lives because of or because with this virus, question to the audience, the number according to the official statistics is 52. 52 people living in Germany under 60 lost their lives because of COVID-19. So how in God's name can the benefits outweigh the risks? The formation of clots in the brain veins is something so horrible to think of. And I told you that you need emergency care. What are the symptoms of brain, of clot formation in the brain vein? The first symptom is a splitting headache. The first symptom is a splitting headache. Then lots have nausea, vomiting, then they have dizziness or let's say their consciousness, is, uh, then they start to have paralysis, they become hard of hearing, blurred vision, all of this. You know, clot formation in brain, uh, in brain veins can give you any symptoms you want. And that is why I think that is the reason why the symptoms of these people who are getting their second shot of vaccine are so diverse, but they would all fit into that. Even these people who have, you know, jerking limb movements that they can't control anymore, this can be one of the consequences of clot formation in these vessels. Dr. Bhakti, what do you say to people who say, well, that was just the AstraZeneca vaccine. Why are you so concerned? Maybe it's not the Pfizer or the Moderna. Well, the, 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 the principle is the same, you see. Uh, the, 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 uh, the reason why this is happening, that's what I believe, is that uh, uh, these vaccines are being taken up by the cells that line the vessels, the so-called endothelial cells. The, you know, it's like the tapestry on the wall. And um, then the spike protein is being produced by these cells of the vessel wall. Now, the, this, this is a disastrous situation because the spike protein itself is now sitting on the surface of the cells facing the bloodstream. And it is known that these spike proteins, the moment they touch platelets, they activate them, all right? And that sets the whole clotting system uh, on. It just, it's a press button. 
The second thing that happens is that, that should happen, according to theory, according to what I used to teach, is that, um, you know, the waste products of this protein uh, th that are produced in the cell are put in front of the door of the cell, which is also towards the lumen, towards the opening uh, where the blood is flowing, and is presented to the immune system. And the immune system, especially the lymphocytes, are there that recognize these cells, they will attack the cells because they don't want them to make virus or virus parts. And the, vi the, the virus parts are now being made uh, at locations that the virus would never ever reach. You know, the vessel wall in your brain, the virus doesn't go there. But if that vessel wall, if that tapestry is then destroyed, you scrape on, your, on the wall, uh, then that is the signal for the clotting system that it should go. And then you're going to get a blood clot, okay? And this happens with all the gene-based vaccines because the genes are being introduced to cells of the vessel wall. That's what we think. So, Dr. Bhakti, could you explain uh, to people as best you can, first of all, what are these mRNA vaccines designed to do? Should they even be called vaccines or are they more like a gene therapy as some of their patents state? What, what are they designed to do and, and how do they work? What, when you say that they're going to teach cells to produce spike proteins in places that they ordinarily might not, how is that? How does that happen and will it last? How long would that last, that process? All right, so we'll go back a bit. Um, now, uh, the conventional vaccines uh, are composed, conventional vaccines against the flu, are composed of the spike. The spike is that part of that, the virus that clutches the handle of the door to your cell, opens it so that the virus can enter the cell. Now, an antibody is created or is, is made when you, you inject the isolated hand of the virus into your body. The immune system then makes antibodies against this hand and the antibodies are there to stop the virus from getting to the handle of the door. And it could work if the antibodies are where the door is. In the case of the mRNA and the AstraZeneca vaccines, one is not injecting the dead limb, the arm, into the body. One is injecting the gene that encodes this limb into your body. You get the shot in your muscle. Those genes enter the bloodstream and those genes will enter the cells they contact, all right? And that's why we uh, thought, you know, if, 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 if a substance uh, enters your bloodstream that is rather large, not sugar, but let's say a gene, all right, um, it will never leave the bloodstream again. There's no way of, to, to get out. The walls of your vessels are closed. You can't see part of them. So Dr. Bhakti, let me just pause you for a second. So let me just see if I've understood this. A normal vaccination it inserts inert or attenuated virus into the bloodstream. This causes the cells to create this uh, spike protein or, or whatever will uh, inspire the production of antibodies. In the case of the mRNA vaccine, the mRNA is instructing, you're not putting in inert virus, what you're doing is you're instructing the cells to create the spike protein on their own. And are you suggesting that the, uh, the mRNA vaccines will instruct more cells than ordinarily would, in fact, cells all over the body to create the spike protein? And what's the danger in that? What's the danger in having many, many cells that ordinarily might not create the spike protein and create the waste products that, that result. What, what will the lymphocyte system do? What, what will our lymph nodes do in response to this? Well, um, you see, the, the, the trouble is that um, one doesn't really know where these genes are going because it's never been looked at. And this is one of the questions we pose to the EMA. Where are the data? Where are the experiments that tell us where this is going? And can you exclude that 
what we are thinking has been excluded because it's so important for what we think and what we, we propose to them is going to take place is that these genes that are injected into the muscle are going to reach, of course, the lymph node, but second and more importantly, they're going to get into the bloodstream. Once they're in the bloodstream, they are captured within the vessel system. You know, it's a, it's a system of uh, pipes and little canals going through your whole body into all organs. But what is in the blood vessel doesn't contact the liver cell. It does not contact the brain cell. It doesn't contact any other. It contacts just the cells that line the vessels, all right, which keep them from exiting the bloodstream. This is something that people don't realize. And we said, therefore, the only cells that will be able to take up these genes in quantity must be the cells that are lining the blood vessels themselves. It sounds logical, I hope. I, I, yes, but so, so what does that mean? What, what, what will end up, or what ends up happening then? What, what ends up is that the gene enters the cell and the gene is, uh, is sort of translated into the spike protein. Okay? It uses the machinery, the protein synthesis machinery of the cell, and it's, it's like uh, uh, an alien code that is put into your factory, and out comes the product, which is the virus spike. And this virus spike, within hours, this spike will sort of protrude out of the cell, okay? and at the same time, the waste products uh, will also be put in front of the door. So there will be the waste products plus the spike. And the spike, on the one hand, will probably activate the platelets just by touch, you know. Whereas the lymphocytes will see the waste products, because that's what they're trained to do, and they're going to try to attack and kill the cells, so that all this waste and that spike is not made anymore, okay? So you have a double path to the tragedy. A double path, yes. And this will happen wherever these spikes are made. And they are probably going to be made at locations where the blood flow is very sluggish because those cells have the most time to take up these packages, all right? And this, it now turns out, we didn't know this when we wrote the letter to the EMA, because, you know, this experiment has never been performed in animals. Humans are now being the test animals. Humans, millions. And now we're seeing the outcome. And the outcome is horrible and frightening. It may be interesting to some, but I find this so absolutely, it's such a nightmare. But Dr. Bhakti, yeah, so, yeah sorry, Dr. Bhakti, but you would say, they say in absolute terms, only 12 or 13 people have died, you know, uh, you would, you and I might say that there were more, but they would say this is providing 90, 95% effectiveness. Why is that wrong? Why are they wrong to say, or first of all, how can they say that their vaccine is 95% effective in the case of uh, Moderna or Pfizer, whichever one claimed that? Is that even a possible thing to say? I mean, isn't the virus 99.9? 97% survivable for most people how can they tell a, how can they tell that the vaccine will be is 95% effective against preventing a, a long term illness or death of course it's nonsense of course they couldn't have shown this because there weren't enough deaths to show they would have had to vaccinate the whole world to show that maybe uh, they saved uh, so and so many lives now i think i said this before during the whole and first wave of the pandemic, 52 people under 60 died because of or with the virus. 52 people. Now, to show that a vaccine was 95% uh, uh, efficient, you would have to have a, a second group who had been vaccinated and shown that less than 52, far less than 52, less than one person had died. And of course, no trial could ever have shown that, and there is no trial. What they showed, or what they 
purported to show, because all, that also was not true, by the way, was that in the case of the Pfizer, I know the numbers there, um, they had 20,000 people who were not vaccinated and 20,000 who were, were vaccinated. And then they counted the numbers of COVID-19 cases in the one group and in the other group. And they came up with numbers like 150 in the unvaccinated group got COVID-19 and only 10 in the vaccinated case uh, group got COVID-19, so the vaccine was 90% or 95% e efficient. I mean, this is the, it, it's so ridiculous. Why is how, that ridiculous? Why? Because how, how did they define COVID-19? Was it death? Of course it wasn't death. It was cough, you know, mild symptoms like cough, sneeze, and a positive PCR test that is lying all the time anyway. <laughs> I mean, you don't go around saying how many people got a cold in one group and so this vaccine has protected 150 people. When I, when I read this, I stopped reading because I, I knew that all this was bullshit. Excuse me, I said, don't go into, you know, if you want to start walling around in shit, it's not good. What they said was, I think in the biotech case, it was 10 severe cases in the control group and one severe case in the vaccinated group. But so, my God, you would vaccinate 20,000 people to save nine people from severe, God knows what severe meant. They were not on the ICU. They were not on ICU, they were not in vitally endangered. And it was also because they, the test was positive, was, which was probably wrong anyway. So, you know. You, you made a great, uh, Dr. Bakhti, you made a great uh, analogy on, in an interview I saw. You talked about tetanus vaccine. So tell us, like, when, when someone gets tetanus, what happens? You die. <laughs> You die, okay? In Thailand, uh, you, 100 people get tetanus, 100 are going to die. In America, because your system is so good, if your doctors are still doing their job, by the way, which they're not anymore, um, uh, you could save half the people's lives or maybe even 70% if your doctors are still working and thinking and using that instruments and training. So what does that tell us about the tetanus vaccine? So in other words, with, with tetanus, which untreated has a 100% or near 100% death rate, when we apply the tetanus vaccine, which people can talk about the safety issues in its manufacture, but in principle, it, it works. Is that not correct? Yes. That's why the tetanus vaccination is good. And that's why I've always taught my students, you know, that uh, they should get vaccinated against tetanus and they should get revaccinated after 10 or 20 years. It doesn't, you know, the, the side effects are really so small, uh, the risks are so small and the benefit is so huge that there can be no question about it. Uh, so, so contrast that with, um, so in other words, you can protect uh, uh, 10 out of 10 people with a, a tetanus vaccine. Whereas, and you can tell that it's working because if they're exposed to tetanus, they don't die. Right. Whereas here, they might not have died in any way, right? Yeah, I right. Mean, with the they won't have died, but you, you go around killing them now with the vaccine, one, and secondly, uh, maiming others for life. Because, you know, uh, even in the vaccination trials, it turned out that several hundred people who got vaccinated got such severe side effects that they had to be treated in the hospital. Okay? So, you, on the one hand, uh, you might have prevented, you might have, I don't believe this anyway, uh, nine severe cases. You prevented 140 mild cases, but in return, you got 100 or 200 side effects that were so severe that they had to be taken care of in the hospital. I heard that some had to be taken to the ICU. I don't have any data, so I'm just saying that's what I heard, but I can believe it. And I don't want to know whether there have been even worse effects that people are not talking about. I, you know, you, uh, excuse me, but uh, this uh, uh, bleeding, profuse bleeding has been seen uh, in, in, in individuals who have taken, uh, gotten the Moderna vaccine, right? They have bleedings in the skin 
uh, uh, this jerking of in, over the whole body, uh, which also can be the consequence of thrombus formation in the brain, uh, has been reported from America, from people taking, uh, getting that vaccine, correct? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And this uh, uh, jerking, which is horrible, uh, you probably, these people will probably never be normal again, you know? Uh, there was a case three days ago in Germany, just three days ago, 29-year-old mother of three children, who's now in, you know, she, it, it's living hell for these people. So let's not fight, guys. Let's sit down and think and do something about this. Good. Let me ask you, Dr. Bhakti, when you look ahead, so what about people who had perhaps some mild or ranging to fairly severe side effects, vomiting, uh, the appearance of quote unquote COVID, um, and, and then it subsided, okay? So as we see in the, you know, obviously millions of people have been vaccinated and, and uh, they have, some have had severe adverse reactions, some have died, but the majority have survived. So what are we worried about for those people? Are we worried that, uh, that something permanent may have happened to their uh, immune system? Is there, is there a possibility that maybe in the presence of uh, a renewed contact with wild virus or in, in some other way that they could uh, enter into a kind of you know, cytokine storm or autoimmune disorder? Or what are, what are the concerns about the, the people who've been vaccinated long term? Yes, uh, that is a very good point and a very important point. In fact, it is precisely that, uh, is that what we fear is going to happen. And the scene is now set because of this mass vaccination of young people. Now you see, this virus uh, is taken care of by you and me and all the young guys whose immune system is trained uh, to live with them. All right, the virus gets into your throat and nose and the virus infects the upper part of the respiratory system, which is the nose and the throat. And the virus will replicate there, and you won't even notice this because those cells are renewed all the time, and the immune system just uses this as a, train, a round of training and gets to know the virus so that if the unfortunate thing happens that should not happen, that the virus, and a lot of the virus, can get into your bronchi and lung, where the cells are not renewed all the time, all right, and enter the cells there, then the immune system will come and take care of the virus by killing the cells of the bronchi and lung that are infected. And that's when you start getting your cough, okay, um, and your pneumonia if it goes down to the lung, and fever, this does not happen if the immune system is not active. People don't get fever when they have a cold or when they have just a sore throat, all right? And you better not meddle around with that. It's a system that has been working all, all the time. So the immune system is trained to combat this virus and the cells that make the virus if things get serious. And that's when the virus replicates to a high extent in the lung. Now. This immune system, you know, it's like an orchestra. Uh, the playing has to be the light, right uh, tone and loudness. And the conductor is there. So we have an, a conductor of our immune system. And whether it's God, whether it's nature, I don't know. But the conductor is perfect. Now what is happening now is that by injecting this gene of the virus, you are meddling with the conductor. And now something is coming to, to confuse the immune system. Now the members of the orchestra are getting the information that they should play, all right? And they should react against this virus part. And the trouble about the immune system is that if you train them to play louder, they're going to go on playing louder and louder every time. Uh, and because you see, if you have an immune system that is trained against one virus and another one comes in and, is, and it 
it doesn't take care of it so well, then it gets, you know, it, 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 it's a part of training and it gets stronger. Now, what is happening now, I fear, is that the immune system is being trained to do something uh, that it would do very well on its own. And now if the real virus comes in, or a virus that is related, because this immune system is much more intelligent than our politicians and our scientists who say it's a new virus and therefore we don't recognize it. This is so foolish that it hurts, all right? And now have a, a, an immune system that is ready to attack. And this virus gets into the lung and is just starting to replicate in a way that is not really dangerous. But you have this overreactive immune system, it's going to come and destroy your lung. Uh, because it's overreacted. This is immune dependent enhancement of disease that we fear is going to happen now. This is going to happen with every related virus. So those guys who think that they're being protected are actually being sensitized so that they're going to become more ill when they get that or a related virus. You should think about this. And this can happen tomorrow, next month, next fall, or next year because our immune system has a long, long memory. Okay? Now, what about those guys who want to get revaccinated? I tell you, if you escaped this time, thank the Lord. But don't do this again, because that immune system, the moment those cells in the vessel lining start making those spikes and putting them out to show again, those killer lymphocytes are going to be so fast. You bet. It's not Russian roulette. It's worse. But if you want to do it, I mean, go ahead. Don't say that we didn't warn you. So your fear is that, uh, first of all, you, you think that, you know, contrary to what we've been told, the, uh, the mRNA shots are going to stay in the body for an extended period of time. Is that, is that correct? Well, no, that I, so, no, no, no. That is not what I said. I said that the immune system has a memory so that if this spike appears anywhere again, uh, it's going to go for it. Those are our lymphocytes. The mRNA only has a relative short life in the cell, okay? It's going to be destroyed. So you don't have to worry about the mRNA being there. Worry about what's being created. That's what you should worry about, and those are the spikes. The danger of the spikes is twofold. The first is the immediate danger of the spike appearing on the cell surface together with the waste, because that makes this location, this part of the vessel wall, the target of uh, or, this, or, or the crystallization point for blood clotting to occur. That is the immediate danger of the spike. The long-term danger is that the spike, having been produced, is going to be recognized by the immune system, and the immune system is going to be trained to combat cells that make the spike on the spot, all right? And this training is going to come to fore, it's going to appear whenever that spike comes, today, tomorrow, next year, okay, when a real virus comes in, or when you get revaccinated. Wouldn't uh, the proponents of this new vaccine say that that's a good thing? We've, we've created, uh, we've trained the lymphocytes to, to kill the spike protein when they see it. What? They don't kill the spike protein. Sorry, it's not the spike protein that's being killed. It's the cell that's making the spike protein. Oh, sorry, sorry, correct, sorry, pardon me. So it, we've, we've trained it to kill infected cells. What's wrong with that? There is nothing basically wrong about that, except that if you do too much of a good job, it becomes a bad job. If you inject the gene so that it gets to places where the virus never was, like in the brain, in the vessel of the brain and you start scraping the walls of your brain vessels, that can kill you. 
And I don't think that any proponents of vaccination can say that's a good thing. Have these vaccines been formally approved? And what does that mean if they haven't? They haven't been formally approved. They have not. In America, they've been approved for emergency use, which means in America that there's no liability, there's no guarantee that they work. Uh, it would be extremely important that everyone taking the vaccine is informed about this, and I'm sure that it's not being done. It's not being done in Europe at, in any event. What about, uh, say, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is not uh, based on mRNA? No. Do you have the same concerns about that vaccine? Yes, of course. It's a gene-based vaccine. It's a gene-based vaccine just like the AstraZeneca, which is also not an mRNA. It's a gene-based. but. We don't have to go into details about what a gene-based vaccine is, whether it's mRNA or a, a vector. Um, the fact is that the gene for the spike, the gene for the spike, not the spike itself, is entering the bloodstream and reaching cells of the blood vessel wall at locations that are actually forbidden. Because if they are then used, these genes are then put into the machinery of the cell to produce those spikes. These spikes are going to be produced at locations where they never are produced normally. Normally they are produced in the lung and vessels of the lung, but not in the vessels of your brain. All right. That is the immediate danger because once they are, you know, once these spikes are produced and extruded through the wall, sticking out into the bloodstream, they're going to be recognized and the immune system is then going to attack the vessel wall cells and try to kill them, okay, as they do in the lung. The thing is that if little clots form in the lung, it's not good, but it's something that the doctors can take care of. But if the clot forms in the brain and you don't know that it's been formed, then you can be into a very, very bad time. Now, the second part was that the waste is also put there. That's the, the spikes and the waste. The spike is going to trigger the platelets and the waste is going to trigger the immune system. Uh, and together, I think we're heading for a catastrophe. And I think that this is taking place in the brain very, very often because all those poor young people getting the second shot have so many splitting headaches, all right? I mean, it's screaming at us. And because the EMA conceded that they had a number of deaths because of brain clots, so we know that the clotting in the brain does take place. People have died and this has been diagnosed, all right? Now, if it happens once, it will happen again. And if you have had 10 deaths, you will have 100 deaths or thousands of deaths. And if the other cases of people who are going blind or deaf, you know, or having this jerking disease, Coria Huntington, that cannot be cured, if you're going to take that into account, say, okay, the benefit is greater, you tell me, whom are you going to convince? There's no time to lose. You've got to act. You've got to stop it. Yes, I just was wondering because um, I spoke to nurses in hospitals uh, who examined uh, patients with COVID-19 before the vaccine. And what they described often were also this clotting in the lungs. Um, yes. How, is this somehow related? Yes, of course. Mechanism? Yes. I mean, yes. What, is the, what is the link between this clotting and that clotting? Because, okay. In the real disease, yeah, what happens is that the linings of the small vessels of the lung are also infected by the virus. You see, the virus is sitting in the lung, then you have damage to the lung, and then the virus gets into the blood vessels. This is true. And then it infects the blood vessel walling. Uh, and when this vessel wall is destroyed, Probably, we don't know this, probably because of the killer lymphocytes, just as it's now being done in the brain, you get a clot. Why not? And also the spikes that are there cause clots to be formed. 
like they're now being formed in the brain. That's why I'm saying, uh, you know, you go around meddling with what nature has taken care of very well, then don't co come around crying and saying something's gone wrong. Uh, if people have gotten the shot and they haven't had any bad symptoms, they can hopefully they, they'll be all right going forward. But yes. you do believe that there is a danger of a long-term impact if they are re-exposed to something, uh, a similar virus. Well, yes. Uh, okay, this is a retake. Yes, of course, because their immune system uh, is now primed to fight. And uh, it is super aggressive. So if the real virus comes in, in the fall, or tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, or next year, or a related virus, you know, there's so many coronaviruses uh, flying around us, uh, and anyone will do. And if they come and infect the lung, the moment those cells start making the slightest bit of the virus, they're going to mount an attack and kill that lung. You know, and, and this is called overreaction, and this would be the immune-dependent enhancement of disease, which is very, very bad potentially. This has been shown to take place in animal experiments where people were in, um, vaccinating against SARS-CoV-1 or MERS. So this sort of thing is known to be able to take place. Um, second, and this is to me perhaps even more frightening, if people get revaccinated, those side effects that will take place in the brain are going to be enforced and magnified. And so those guys who escaped the first time may not escape another time. And a third time or fourth time, I don't think so. So with every revaccination against the new mutant this fall, yeah, uh, before anyone takes that third shot, I think that you better make your will. Dr. Bhakti, I guess, uh, what's, what's the final message you want to leave people with? The final message is, let's quit fighting each other. Let's get together because we have a real problem, guys. This problem is going to hit you too. Even the people, the proponents. Why don't you sit back and think about it? Imagine that there's a grain of truth in things that we've been saying today. Then you are endangered when you take the vaccine. Your family is endangered. Your children are going to be endangered. I'm horrified that children are now being given the jab in clinical trials. I think it's Moderna, right? Six month old children. This is criminal. I hope you realize that this is criminal, that you are endangering your own children. How can you? How can you do this?